Nathan Finlay is a co-founder of MetaMask, one of the main wallets for people to interact with Web3. In our conversation, we'll dive into Dan's background prior to co-founding MetaMask, where he sees MetaMask heading in the coming years, their privacy policies, a potential mask token, Dan's hopes and dreams for the next bull run, and much more. But first, Dan will tell the origin story of MetaMask. I was working uh, at Apple with my friend uh, Aaron Davis at Kumavis, and he uh, went to a Bitcoin meetup and saw Vitalik give a talk about uh, Ethereum. And we started talking about it every day at lunch and uh, what we would make if we had a computer that you could just trust and run transparently. And I had done a few experiments before. I'd, I'd wanted micropayments for Reddit upvotes and I'd wanted uh, decentralized voting. I'd been following a couple projects that enabled, were, their goal was to decentralize democracy or debate. And all of those applications had certain problems about establishing roots of trust. And so there, were, I had a few project ideas I was excited about right away where I, I thought, oh, having a trustworthy computer could be a solution to this. So we were really excited to figure out what it would mean to build an application on Ethereum. And the first thing we needed was an account manager. And so we started building the road to the place we wanted to go. And uh, it turned out that a good account manager on a permissionless, extensible, Turing-complete computer that is still learning to uh, scale and be private um, is uh, a big, long project, much bigger than I think any of us expected at the beginning. Um, but uh, but it's been a, an obviously really important component of a successful uh, decentralized ecosystem. And so I think we've kind of found us, ourselves growing into a new product category. Super interesting. Um, so... Uh, MetaMask at first was viewed as an account manager. So how how has that vision changed over time to what we know today? Yeah, well, I think so at the beginning, it was an account manager. And in Ethereum, the account is the fundamental unit of all authority holding. So I think that the Ethereum protocol still enforces that the account is a fundamental kind of unit. Um but at the beginning, you know, the accounts, all accounts were just private keys because people didn't have a, a suite of smart contracts to and tools for building smart contracts to draw from. Uh, so we've kind of gradually seen more and more sophisticated patterns and paradigms evolving. You know, I, I think right away we knew there was a future with, you know, democracy or like multi-sigs and things like that. But it's taken a while for some of those options to kind of mature up to the level where um, it's increasingly less a conversation of like, oh, will we achieve that? And more a question of like, how should we best compose those pieces and and enable people to compose them? Um, so so, yeah, accounts are still a major thing that we do today, but also, you know, managing the assets within those accounts. Um, those could be fungible tokens or non fungible tokens, and people manage all sorts of things that aren't uh, fungible or non-fungible within their accounts, uh, like votes or like uh, streaming payments or, uh, you know, yeah, game assets or, or just their their ability to interact or, or contracts that they own. So it's kind of this increasingly general purpose digital inventory where people keep all sorts of things they can do around the web in a way that lets them connect to other websites and use those same privileges in new contexts. I'd love to learn more about your background too like uh, how how did you get to start playing on ethereum yeah well i guess having uh, kumavis uh introduce me to the ideas was definitely the first introduction to ethereum and we couldn't really build anything on ethereum until we had an account manager so that was important i don't know do you want me to like go back to like what were the other projects that like made me uh interested in this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like how, how did you get into into crypto? Like where were you working before? Or what were you doing? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I did. Uh, I remember the original Bitcoin faucet post on Slashdot and I tried to get it to work and I may have gotten some and then lost that wallet. Um, but I didn't really understand it back then. And uh, I did a little freelancing and got some Bitcoin for, for work that I did at some point. I was doing a lot of freelancing um, out of college, I was, I graduated into the recession. And so there was like, I did a lot of just 
kind of hustling around doing just whatever odd jobs I could find. As a software engineer? No, I, I ended up teaching myself to write software during that period. I, they were just, I, I graduated with a degree in, in English literature and uh, it was hard to get uh, w work that I was interested in in that area. If I wanted to just be an English teacher, it probably would have been easy, but that wasn't quite what I wanted. Um, so I just ended up doing a lot of weird jobs. I started a screen printing company and um, and uh, tutored and taught it, uh, taught computers at a, an art center and things like that. Um, so just doing a lot of weird random jobs out of the out of college, kind of looking for what would be meaningful to me. And it just happened to be computers are super interesting, you know? So a lot of project ideas inevitably drew me towards computers. And it was such an empowering thing, being able to just program up an idea that you have and then share it with the whole world. Like, I don't know of any skill that is quite that high leverage. Well, more and more, you know, things like podcasting and video producing, you get a similar effect where it's like digital amplification. And that's just so incredibly cool. I think YouTube wasn't quite where I would have needed it to be back then. So, so at the time, like writing an app was still like the most like powerfully permissionless digital skill for just reaching a huge audience with, you know, just, just an idea and, and some effort. That's incredible. So, okay. You, you, your degree is in English literature and you, you taught yourself how to code. What language did you start with? Kind of depends how, what you count as a language, because like I, I wrote some uh, mods for Starcraft, but that's like kind of a, I'm not sure if people count that as a language. It's like, it's like a visual build your own scripting language or something. Um, and then eventually I got hired to teach video game design using MIT scratch, which again is kind of a visual building block thing. And we did some macro media fusion. Um, I think at a certain point I hit a limit with those kinds of tools where I was just like, I need to be able to do anything. And so I started learning uh, iOS development with Objective C. So I think Objective C was the first, like, what I don't know, like a purist might call a programming language that I learned. But I, I kind of, you know, coming from a uh, literature background, to me, these are all just languages. They're always of expressing things. So I, I'm really, I, I don't know, I think Excel is kind of a programming environment, you know, and I think that, I mean, I think that that's getting validated more and more, right? AIs can write programs for you now if you can just explain what you want very well. So I think that the line between uh, a programming language and just the ability to express an intention so that a computer can do it, I think it's getting blurrier and blurrier. And so the skill is less and less, uh, can you remember where to put a semicolon? And it's more and more, do you have something meaningful that you want to do? That's so interesting. Um, and then you, I guess you learned Solidity to start working on, on the MetaMask app. Yeah, I, I learned a little solidity to do my own kind of prototype dApps. But the truth is that most of MetaMask is written in JavaScript, um, even still today. Um, I have I have written some solidity um, for a few, usually side projects. Uh, in many ways, MetaMask is a product that, you know, from the very beginning, it was trying to allow me to build things I wanted to build. And I still kind of feel like that's where it is. Like, I feel like MetaMask will be where I want it to be when I can spin up a weekend project that, you know, is a new side business, you know, and uh, there, there's just so many things that, you know, could be improved by having this kind of technology really easy and really accessible. And uh, I, I still don't think we're quite there yet. Um, you know, <laughs> like like a, a recent one that came to mind was just like the the honest mechanic problem. Like, like you go to a, you take your car into a shop and you're always like, Oh, can I, is this a trustworthy mechanic? Is this a good one? And you, you always like rely on a friend's recommendation. And if you go on Yelp, you never know if, you know, are these paid uh, reviews or are they hiding ones? You know, Yelp had that whole controversy, of, like hiding good reviews if you didn't pay and stuff. And it's just like so hard to establish credibility. And that's got to be extra hard for like honest mechanics. Like, so I think there's like this real need for even just in that one domain, just the, and, and, you know, it's got to apply to many, many other ones, right? Finding somebody who's honest and trustworthy to help you out is kind of the big problem of society. Like how do you trust a stranger to cooperate with them in some way? And until we make that easy and safe, then I, I think we've still got a long way to go. How do you see MetaMask playing a role there? Is MetaMask supposed to be, like the the trusted mechanic that people just know 
they they can go to? No, I, I mean, you know, I think it's great for us to be as trustworthy and trusted as we're capable of being. But we're not mechanics and we don't know your local mechanic. So really what I think we increasingly are doing at MetaMask is we are embracing the fact that we are not uh, a we're not a trusted third party. We are a tool for you to trust whatever you want to trust. And, you know, the kind of original promise of blockchain is you don't have to trust anyone. And that's true. And you can hold some crypto and, you know, the cost of attack is incredibly high. But also, you know, you interact with this new smart contract, you put some tokens in it, you grant it some allowance. There is some trust there uh, as as transparent as we try to make it. At the end of the day, there there's always going to be little leaps of trust. And so our job is to let you kind of build out your kind of digital network of trust. And that should eventually extend to things like even your local economy. It shouldn't just be smart contracts. It should, if we have a full, uh, a, an increasingly rich kind of financial trust graph, we should be able to leverage it for all sorts of signals, including who's a local mechanic you can trust, but also, you know, what's uh, the, the most cost efficient way for you to purchase X good or, or, or whatever. So, yeah, talk to me more about this bigger kind of long term vision for MetaMask. What does MetaMask look like in 20 years? Uh, in 20 years? Um, so if everything goes well or like yeah. if. <laughs> yeah. um, so like, OK, so if the climate collapses now. Um, all right. So. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, seriously, we probably should factor in the fact that like a lot of planetary resources are getting kind of thrashed. And so I think that people are going to need more and more stable ways of establishing connections to resources they can rely on. Um, you know, the, I live in California and we keep getting worse droughts. This year we had some rain, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to need tools that let us um, say, look, here's what I need. And I need to find it. So here's here's what I can offer. Here's what I need. I, I think this is kind of a, um, let's say, like a coincidence of wants solver, I think would be a great eventual target for a wallet or for for decentralized finance in general. Um, you've got some number of things that you can offer to the world and you're trying to figure out what are the things you should do? What are the things you can contribute uh, that are most aligned with what you want to do and that achieve the goals that you personally have? Um, so in 20 years, you know, we don't know exactly what the ledgers are going to look like. We don't know, you know, they're coming a long way. We're getting better scalability. We're getting cheaper verification. Uh, we're starting to get some uh, more and more privacy options. Although, you know, legality is, seems to be a constant, uh, friction point. Um, but I think that we're going to kind of continue tending towards, uh, people coming up with ways that they want to associate kind of casting those offers out to the internet and then having increasingly sophisticated uh, digital intermediation. You might kind of have a, your phone obviously is going to be an increasingly sophisticated AI and it might be always trawling the web looking for good opportunities for you. Like, oh, hey, here's here's someone who could use your, you know, if I'm, if I'm a gardener, gardening service and they're able to offer you, you know, um, I, I do think that when economies are in low states, localized currencies are increasingly valuable. So being able to accept and value increasingly local currencies is a critical component in surviving downturns and depressions. So um, so when you've got a coincidence of wants solver, let's say, it's going to be evaluating what you can offer the world against what you're hoping to get out of it. And it's going to be trying to get you the best rate. And so it might be suggesting gigs to you. It might be suggesting opportunities. Um, it might be um, pointing out to you uh, connections in your social graph that could use introductions. So it's like, hey, this person says they're looking for, you know, a roofer and you know someone who's a good roofer. Would you like to vouch for them, for example? And you could get commissions when you endorse people. Um, so I think that uh, I think this technology is going to tend towards a kind of privacy first, but localism first uh, economy where people are getting rewarded for helping facilitate connections and identify economic cycles, uh, which would be like opportunities where there's recurring mutual benefit. 
uh, to the engagement. If you liked our recent episode with Matthew Gold on digital identity in Web3, then I have the perfect podcast for you. Web3 with A16C Crypto. Produced by venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, this podcast is your definitive resource for the future of the internet. From the latest trends to research and insights from top scientists, developers, and creators. And if you need somewhere to start, I'd highly recommend listening to their heavy-hitting episode with It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia's Rob McElhenney on the future of decentralized media. Follow Web3 with A16C Crypto on your favorite listening app. Tell them that Defiance sent you. So what you're describing is a lot broader than, you know, what we now understand a wallet does, right? Like... Uh, you know, MetaMask is a place where, you know, y you hold your different assets. Uh, it's a, a way to kind of interact and, and access different Web3 dApps. It's like, I don't know, I think it's viewed as kind of this gateway to, to crypto and to Web3. Um, and, you know, now, uh, as of recently, it also lets you swap within Um, the wallet itself, uh, but what you're describing goes way kind of beyond that. Uh, you're describing something that's more like similar to a Google, you know, like if, if you're you're describing this place where the app lets you find kind of what, what you're looking for and even recommends places or services or things that could be useful. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of... Uh, Very, it looks looks very different from from what MetaMask does today. That's interesting. Yeah, I I think that one way that it's critically different from what Google does is that Google tries to solve these problems in a largely global way. So if you type in you know car mechanic, it may ask where you are, and it may incorporate some of your past search history. But what it's not doing is incorporating totally private, personal. Uh, social network type information. And uh, at MetaMask, we are trying to build like a user centric cryptography first uh, user agent. So if we're talking about your wallet eventually helping you find, let's say, a good mechanic. Now, it may not be that you're ever searching for a mechanic in the wallet. It may be that you go to a website and you connect your wallet to it. And then the web wallet says, And the website maybe says, hey, in order to recommend someone in your social graph, uh, I need access to some social graph information. And and hopefully we're able to do it in a privacy preserving kind of uh, selective disclosure kind of way. Um, but that's this whole open creative challenge to cryptography. Like what is the most privacy preserving, most kind of user consent preserving way to interact with the Web? And we don't want to interfere with the web's uh, development. We, the, the web is you know, full of human creativity, and it's only getting more interesting, especially with all this AI stuff going on, right? But these AIs are still just working with kind of public data. And we're in this kind of weird, tense relationship between wanting all the benefits of an AI helping us with everything versus needing some domain that is private or local to you because that's how you hold assets uh, that that can't be uh, taken from you or, or that nobody else has a total authority over um, and, and and how you kind of preserve competitive advantage in the world, right? Private information is kind of like the heart of, uh, yeah, making uh, unique uh, decisions in the world. Um, so, so, yeah, I guess you're right that it's kind of like Google in that it's like, I do think that a user agent like MetaMask should eventually be helping you do all sorts of things. But I think that, you know, it's part of the kind of crypto line thing, which is trying to help people make these decisions uh, in ways that don't just hand all the power over to the service that's providing it to them. So it's interesting what you're saying is that um, blockchains can help make a more user-centric or like a more localized, like more personalized version of a search engine like Google. I mean, not just blockchains, but yeah, I mean, the collection of decentralized uh, protocols. So some of it may be blockchain rooted assets. Some of it may be, you know, counterfactual claims or verifiable credentials. Um, but it's kind of this collection of protocols that we have available when we employ cryptography in a, in a way where the user has their own kind of local 
a user agent, right? It's, it's holding some keys for you and it tries to act on your behalf. And so what does a web look like where uh, you're, you're kind of in control of a little bit more and you're being a little bit more deliberate about when you uh, share that control? And so you, you've mentioned privacy and uh, recently there was, you know, some, some concern about a MetaMask sharing user IP addresses. So I think it was like because of um, of, of Infura, I, I think it, you you had to kind of disclose that. So how do you how do you deal with with those with those requirements and and how do you I mean how can you add privacy to something like like MetaMask when you're dealing in a completely kind of open space? How do you strike that uh, balance? So when we first made MetaMask, we did make some design trade offs. Uh, to make the entire platform more accessible to new users. And Infura was a critical one of those trade-offs. And uh, I think that it's pretty widely agreed that it was a good decision because it it means it's so much easier to get started. You know, there's a lot of obstacles to getting involved in crypto today. And if every single person had to run a full node of Ethereum, I, I think we'd be significantly further behind than we are today. Um, Maybe we would have accelerated like like client development, but uh, uh, that's just not where we were at the time. So we, we host some uh, trusted uh, way to get uh, the data. And there were some parts of Infura infrastructure that uh, were keeping some logs. And so we uh, felt the duty to disclose that privacy practice immediately while we figured out how to clean up the infrastructure. Um, I think we underestimated how severe the public backlash would be from this disclosure. It was perceived as a change in policy, a shift in direction that we were now uh, exploiting user data for profit and maybe selling it and, uh, you know, giving it around in all sorts of covert backroom ways. Uh, I don't believe that any of that is the case. Um, we were merely disclosing how our internal infrastructure worked. Uh, but fortunately, in response to the outcry, I think we made reasonable improvements to that system. Uh, so we no longer store uh, IP addresses ever for more than five days. And I, I know we're, I think it's actually better than that, but we're uh, waiting to make an even more positive uh, announcement on that topic. But, but long-term, the solution shouldn't be that we make ourselves more trustworthy, of course. Uh, the solution should be that we increasingly make it possible to use protocols that give you the option of not having to trust a third party. And this isn't just our problem. This is an ecosystem problem. And there are a variety of solutions out there that are um, providing uh, varying degrees of, you know, potential privacy improvements. Um, I, I think that we're eager to adopt one that feels strong enough, um, but we're also, you know, always configurable. So users can choose whatever uh, source of Ethereum blockchain connection they want. You, know, you can self-host, you can use somebody else, whatever. Uh, we're evaluating our own uh, potential solutions. Um, Infura is working on a decentralized version of itself. You know, So it's, it's a long road to letting people just not trust someone for that data. Um, and, but I think that we're just trying to build a tool that increasingly lets users um, kind of make the decisions and the trade-offs that make sense to them based on the options that are available right now. And the options today are getting better. Okay, but but that's interesting that since that disclosure of how the your your infrastructure works, you've made this change that now you're only storing that information, you know, IP addresses for five days. Yeah, and we're never associating IP addresses with user accounts. That was the other big thing. And and we never were or wait, uh we we certainly aren't now. I I I need to dig back into this stuff. Yeah. So so we're we're never associating user accounts with IP addresses. So the biggest kind of privacy concern I think has been kind of mitigated. Um, people can continue to if they want to be extra cautious, they can run their own infrastructure, and we're going to continue trying to make progress towards being even better. But um, but yeah, it's. It's always a game of trade-offs uh, as we kind of make progress. Silo Finance protects borrowers from risk with its innovative risk isolation. Unlike traditional lending markets, when you borrow on Silo Finance, you know your risk upfront. 
Join thousands of users borrowing and lending crypto you cannot find somewhere else. Bonus, they're running an incentive program so you might earn additional yield while enjoying your peace of mind. What are your thoughts on some of the uh, smart wallets that are emerging? You know, there's there's a bunch, uh, Gnosis, Rainbow, and it looks like a step forward. Argent, I guess, is the other big one. I mean, there, there, there's a few, but it definitely looks like a step forward for a user experience, you know, the, the ability to have easier account recovery, maybe abstract some of the gas confirmations and all those kind of little things that, that just make the Web3 experience a little bit strange. Um, they're, they're pretty good at abstracting that away, while MetaMask still feels very like you need to kind of be a bit of of an insider to kind of get how to use it like a lot of the, the interface is still pretty complex so yeah i mean do you do you view smart contract wallet as a competitor are you building uh, maybe your own or like i don't know are you looking to include some of those features on, on metamask yeah, I think there's a lot of great stuff happening in the domain of smart contract accounts. And I think it's only getting better uh, with like EIP 4337. It's getting easier to have smart contract accounts that um, can delegate the payment of the transaction to other mechanisms, either uh, other tokens or to other payers, which makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I think that long term, uh, account management shouldn't just be about private key holding. Um, at MetaMask, you know, we were the first Web3 wallet. So, of course, uh, a lot of our accounts are using kind of the earliest technology. And so a lot of the way that we evolve is kind of making some trade-offs to preserve uh, continuity for existing users. Um, so that's that's a tough trade-off to make. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're not uh, really excited about and making progress towards a world where we can have contract accounts kind of in the mix continuously. Um, and and I think that really the, the space for contract accounts and things like that to uh, be increasingly sophisticated is just enormous. I think that they uh, they compose really well. Um, you know, it makes a lot of sense to maybe have a multi-sig so that you have two factor for your account but then also be a signer on maybe an organizational multi-sig um, or even to use that multi-sig to vote on a larger DAO. Um, so we want to allow not just uh, a single account paradigm because as, as great as maybe social recovery is, um, there is still innovation happening at the protocol layer. Um, even smart contract accounts today, they still, for example, lack any financial privacy, right? So I think it's it's easy to see that uh, we're not yet at the end game. Um, and so MetaMask has been investing in creating foundations for kind of continued evolution in the space of account management. Um, and for the last three years, we've been working on a project called Snaps, which is an extensibility project. And one of the targets of the Snaps system is to let people plug in additional account managers. Um, so if you do have a Gnosis Safe or an Argin account, you should be able to plug those right into your MetaMask. Um, now, you might already, uh, to some degree, uh, I think that most people who are using Gnosis Safe today are signing those Gnosis Safe uh, transactions with their MetaMask. So there's already a lot of kind of healthy interoperability between these tools. Um, and I think it's going to just get more interesting as we make it easy to um, kind of bring these uh, different account models into one place where they're even easier to kind of compose into ways that make sense to you. And and I think that this will not always look like just having one account with a sophisticated recovery scheme. I think this will also mean doing things like having devices deployed with limited permissions or you know, having session keys when you log into websites. And, uh, it, and those aren't just concerns about having uh, accounts. Those are uh, concerns about how you kind of split up your authority in general. Um, I increasingly think people shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket at all. I mean, I, I never did <laughs> recommend doing that. You know, at the very least, people today have a cold wallet and a hot wallet. People who are uh, getting sophisticated. Uh, but I think we want to make it easier and easier to for, for normal users to have uh, their assets divided up in a way that 
really make sense to them. So maybe they have them all recoverable with some social recovery scheme, but they should still make it easy enough to provision a new device, log into a website with that device, um, maybe maybe use that device to provision an additional device. Um, so uh, I think that there's just a enormous ways to go in in the domain of uh, of improving the account model and what it means to manage your assets. Um, so we're we're betting on the long game. Um, I think there are some really great demonstrations of how great the UX can be with a smart account uh, today. Um, but I think that uh, long term, being able to interact with any site on any chain <laughs> with any kind of account just requires a really kind of fundamental reimagining of what it means to hold authority, the digital authority uh, in your computer at all. Your thinking is smart contract accounts look great and they're useful, but you don't think that's where kind of account management will be in the in the long term. Like like you, you still think there's kind of more room to improve at maybe the the, the protocol level. Uh, and that's what you're exploring with MetaMask. Is, is that right? Well, yeah. So there's at least room to uh, improve. Uh, yeah, at least in privacy, probably also in scalability. And because there's still room to improve, we want to create a wallet where you can uh, experiment and improve more. And so, you know, I, I think that we're basically just not betting that we're going to make the final contract account right off the bat. So we're we're investing in making a bit of a laboratory where we and other developers can iterate and experiment with uh, other models. So I'm really excited for all the current uh, models of smart contract account, uh, largely because they're letting us validate user experience flows that feel, you know, totally futuristic. Um, but with an eye to the fact that uh, there are a lot of ways that we still want to improve and we don't want to just bet, ever, bet the next decade on like one, one uh, set of features, for example, you know, as great as let's say DeFi lending is. Uh, it's far from the only thing we want to enable people to do. Trade DeFi like a pro with Orbs Layer 3. Orbs has integrated with SpookySwap, SpiritSwap, and Pangolin to bring you decentralized algorithmic trading. Currently live on all three DEXs, you can trade DeFi with an edge via Orbs' decentralized time-weighted average price order type. Reduce price impact, dollar cost average, and more with DTWAP's intuitive UI. Learn more at orbs.com slash DTWAP. What, what are kind of the, the next big builds or like milestones for MetaMask? I mean, I don't know. I've, I've, I've seen that recently. You're, you have, you've announced like a, that you're working with a few on-ramps. So is, is that kind of a, a major piece on, on the roadmap? I don't know. Like what are kind of the biggest milestones that you're working towards? Yeah. So we do have continuously improving on-ramps. So people in more and more regions are going to find it easier and easier to get their first crypto. And we do have this portfolio view that you can get through the main wallet today. And it just keeps getting better and better. Uh, it's got bridging in it now. And it also lets you, of course, do the swaps and kind of get an overview of all your accounts. So we're, we are working on just improving the kind of base layer uh, convenience of doing the most common actions. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're also working on this whole extensibility system. And uh, I believe this year, hopefully next quarter, uh, we'll be launching the SNAP system um, with its first APIs. And... Uh, that's going to begin uh, a period of enabling more protocols in the MetaMask wallet. And um, and not just more protocols, but potentially, um, well, m new ways of interacting, right? Not every protocol is a blockchain. Some protocols might be a selective disclosure protocol uh, or a verifiable credential protocol or, um, you know, some kind of auto, <laughs> auto bot for <laughs> trading uh or, you know, we're really interested to see what people come up with. Um, all the experiments we've seen so far are really interesting. So, um, yeah, we, we are in uh, the biggest milestone probably in the next year, aside from, yeah, well, all those things that people are looking forward to at the bridging uh, and the swaps and um, staking uh, kind of integrated really conveniently. I think we're looking forward to making it easy to integrate your favorite protocols and account types right into the wallet. 
Very cool. Okay, so and that's uh, the Snaps product. Yeah. Uh, okay, and, and that's going to be an API that allows other, you know, uh, dApps, uh, protocols to um, connect to MetaMask. Is that how it works? And, and extend its functionality. So they may add a new account type that, you know, like a Bitcoin account type, you may have Bitcoin within your wallet and be able to hold your ordinal NFTs, or it might let you uh, connect your data backpack from uh, Disco so that you can go around the web and kind of, you know, bring your user profile to different websites. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to start to grow and expand a, a bit of what the wallet is getting used for. Um, but then also, yeah, letting us start to plug in other account types is really critical. And once we've cultivated a couple that we're excited about, uh, we can start, you know, recommending those to users and, um, yeah, making it really easy to, for users to get started with security models that make sense to them. Nice. Okay. So is, is this how MetaMask can be multi-chain? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, one of the challenges about being multi-chain is that there seems to be like a new blockchain every week or so, and we're not experts on every blockchain. And we think that a wallet that supports a blockchain should be expert on that chain. Um, so rather than try to become masters of everything ourselves, we're trying to kind of open it up a little bit, um, try to uh, make it a more of a community driven thing. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, work out a system where uh, specialists in different protocols uh, can find it worth their time to uh, build modules within MetaMask. Is that where a potential token can, can fit? Uh, I guess everything's where a potential token could fit. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're speaking about like incentivizing builders. So I don't know, that just seems like yep. a good place. Yeah, I, I don't think you're the first person to suggest that one. <laughs> Um, so, uh, there's like always spe speculation on, on the mask token. Uh, I don't know. Is, uh, is there any, any news on that or, uh, anything you can say about, about it being in, in your roadmap? It sure is impressive. People know the name of a token that's never been announced. Yeah. They, they've made it up. It, it's decided. People have decided <laughs> it's called mask. <laughs> there's another token already called that, but I guess we, we uh -huh. could just shove our way in um yeah uh we don't have any <laughs> announcements of a mask token uh to make today sorry <laughs> all right um i also um wanted wanted to know the latest on kind of the institutional product uh mm -hmm. I, I know that th there's some like an institutional metamask how is it uh being used like what's what's the latest on that yeah so metamask institutional lets custodial key managers offer white labeled versions of metamask to institutions that have particular kind of custody custody requirements. Um, and it's cool because it allows us to experiment with a slightly different set of features for those customers uh, within that product. And uh, there's always this potential of validating features that are so good or, you know, that fit right, that we can then bring it into the consumer version of MetaMask. Um, but yeah, today it has uh, a healthy number of custodians and, and users, and uh, it's building a feature set that is uh, unique, but, um, you know, integrates a little bit more of what, you know, a non-crypto native institutional crypto investor might hope to see. So who, who are uh, some of your institutional uh, users? Uh, I don't know them offhand. I'm sorry. I, I uh, Part of the reason we have it formed as another team is so that I can kind of uh, help focus on the the core wallet product which kind of fills out my brain uh, as it is apologies to the institutional team <laughs> no yeah i was wondering if, if it's like big big banks or or like hedge funds or is it more like crypto vcs or i don't know just was wondering on kind of the, the type of user but no worries if if you don't have that uh, info right now yeah sorry I, they weren't uh it didn't uh resonate to me as big bank names uh sorry i i yeah. Okay, that's that's okay. I'd love to hear uh, some of the the latest um, you know, activity uh, numbers. Like how many users have a MetaMask? Have you seen kind of the the active uh, users uh, drop uh, recently in the bear? Like what what are some of the, the 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 most recent numbers and trends? Yeah. Yeah, I think like at the peak of uh last year, uh 2022, I think we we got 
to around 30 million monthly active users. And then when the bear began, we saw it drop, uh, yeah, significantly, something like half. And it's been kind of stable around there uh, since then. So there's kind of, that tends to follow the usual cycle that we've seen where uh, the bull market brings in a bunch of new people. And then when the market crashes, like half of them leave or something, but some of them stay up. So it's kind of got this like ratcheting up effect. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's uh, always sad to see, you know, the bear market come and, you know, especially because it hurts people. Um, those those later people, they're usually the people who, you know, least expected it and least knew what they were getting into. Um, but uh, I, I think that it reflects kind of this continuous process that we've seen a few times before. So so you're seeing about 15 million uh, monthly active users now? Probably right in that neighborhood. So it was like at 30 million at the peak, but do you know at what um, how many there were like before the, the bull market began? Like maybe 2020? In 2020, it was, it was way less. I think maybe a, a few million. Like like we, we grew, it was like, yeah, tenfold during the last uh, bull market. Yeah, that's... I think that's kind of um, what a lot of people miss in kind of the the beginning of, of the bear. Like, yeah, like we see a huge pullback from the peak. But if we go back, you know, just like to where we were before the, the bull market began, it's still a huge increase. And, and I think you, you see that across the board in, in, in Web3 and crypto. It still hurts to, to say, like, we lost, you know, uh, 15 times as many users as we had at the beginning of the year or something <laughs> yeah. like it sounds impossible about kind of the your your swaps product how has that gone like can you disclose information on how much revenue that's that's generating and maybe how many you know how much uh, volume people are are swapping I, I guess so. I I, I don't want to I don't want to like dig up dashboards while we're on or I don't know if that's if that's rude or whatever. No, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so people are swapping. Uh, it's way less than it was during the bull market. Um, if the bull market was perpetual, we'd be totally set and fine. Um, we're not totally set forever anymore. Um, we yeah. Uh, if the bear market continued indefinitely, we we would need to figure out some additional revenue. Um, so we are trying to figure out uh, what else we can do to bring uh, value to our users. Um, we're always going to uh, make sure that the product is free by default and tries to preserve all of the user uh, agency that, that we can. And so there's this kind of constant question of like, what can we offer that is it's not excessively pushy, but it is an opportunity that hopefully makes the user's life easier, maybe gets them a better deal than they would if they did their own research. Uh, and can help us support the wallet's development. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Swaps has been incredible. Um, people who use it completely love it. It's probably the most reliable swapping uh, contract on mainnet. Uh, I don't think we advertise that enough. Um, like, uh, you know, we strive for it to probably get you the best deal that you can get. But, you know, we do take a fee so that, you know, cuts down on the savings. But if you incorporate the reliability Uh, I think that for most users, it's a sanity preserving experience and uh, I, I sure use it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's doing it's doing its job very well. So I think it's got like a 99% success rate. What are some of the um, those kind of additional useful features that uh, that you're thinking of of incorporating? So we're working on bridging right now. So if you go to our portfolio DAP at portfolio.metamask.io, You can see that we've got some kind of curated uh, bridge aggregation. So if you're trying to get from, you know, mainnet to optimism, um, we we've got a few different routes that you can take. And, you know, at that moment, we'll get you we'll suggest the best rate for you to move a token from one chain to another. Um, that's kind of hard work because we have to make sure that there are chains that we trust to curate uh, for each of those uh, connections between chains. Um, but that team's doing great and it's looking super reliable so far. And uh, so that does seem to be like one of those things where where we can let users do whatever they want. They can use whatever bridge they want. But if we can make it uh, way easier and probably save them money while they're at it, 
um, then you know, hopefully users will find it worth their while to to use our uh, approach. Okay, that, that's that's super that's super interesting, and and I guess it makes sense that from from bridging there will be kind of other on chain uh, actions that MetaMask will kind of uh, help users execute, right? Yeah, yeah, I think we're looking out for like what would we be uniquely positioned to help users do. Obviously, it has to be stuff where it's like common enough that a lot of people are doing it. Um, but but our kind of mandate is uh, make sure the user can always do kind of whatever they want in all of DeFi and then just kind of try to offer services uh, in, in the wake of all the creative innovation that happens while they're doing all of that. What do you wish developers would build in, in this bear market? Like what, what would you want to see in DeFi or just crypto in general? Oh, there's so many things that I would like to see built. Um, I mean, I, I'm uh, working with uh, one group called District Labs to build out uh, this delegation framework that I, I started uh, proving out that I'm excited about. Um, we've got a couple collaborators working on something called Moby Mask, which is an anti-phishing thing. Um, I'd love to see more. Um, so, so delegation, I think, is really important, and I think it's underutilized. I think we've got some great DAO tooling today for like pooling funds and making decisions as a single group. But then uh, DAOs get then stuck where they can only make these huge decisions as a group. And I think that if we had better delegation tools for DAOs, you could do more things like having a subcommittee that is empowered to make decisions up to a certain size or up to filling a certain budget on its own. And subcommittees could delegate to individuals even. And um, I think that delegation is just this tool where you basically leverage trust that exists uh, to gain performance and speed and uh, you know dynamic agency and, and reclaim that. Um, so while the blockchain is already provably very good for distrusting things. I like to see more tools for selectively trusting things. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of DeFi where you trustlessly lend to things or you trustlessly yield farm. Um, I want to see more tools where people use uh, their digital currency to do real things. Uh, either, you know, start small businesses or crowdfund real projects and, um, uh, you know, uh, I want to see I want to see those alternatives to all the sharing economy apps that uh, give people a slightly better deal. Um, so, but yeah, be the bear time. The bear market's a wonderful time for building. Um, a lot of the constant stress uh, of FOMO is kind of out of the air, and so you can step back and you can think about okay, but what are we actually trying to build for? And um, yeah, the world needs a lot of coordination, uh, a lot of improved coordination, and so. Um, I think picking a problem that you see in the world and trying to imagine how you would try to solve it and what's in your way and if blockchains can help uh, build those pieces. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if if all that kind of does happen during the bear market, what do you think will be the the next kind of big thing in the next bull market? You know, how like NFTs was for the, the past one, ICOs from the, for the previous one. What do you think can be kind of the big thing for the next one? Yeah. Um, if, if all of that stuff worked, uh, and all that got built, then I would think the next bull market is about reality and doing real things. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> so not just, not just investing and, in, you know, swapping one token for another that hopefully has a higher yield, but, uh, channeling our funds and pooling them to see results in the real world that we think are important. That's, that's the ultimate test. Amen. Um, yeah, th th that would be amazing if we actually get a, a bull market based on kind of real world use cases. Um, great, uh, Dan, this, this has been super interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to chat and yeah, really look forward to uh, this, this huge uh, vision for, for, for MetaMask that I, I had no idea uh, this kind of like localized, personalized Google of, of Web3. Really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, thanks again. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me, Camila. <laughs>